got Kath Booth, who's that was that just their comment. Kath is a consultant hematologist specialising in transfusion, working in a joint role between NHS BT and Bart's Health. A role within NHS BT includes providing clinical support to the red cell immunology laboratories and giving advice on complex transfusion issues to hospitals across London and South East. She's also a really active member of uh, your RTT. Lovely, thanks, Phil. Um, so I'm going to talk about a, a complex case of hemolytic disease with the fetus and newborn that a number of us at um, the blood service were involved in um, advising and managing. So this is a 38 year old lady. She's group A D negative and we meet her in her fourth pregnancy. So she's had three um, previous deliveries. Um, and we'll, we'll look through a little bit of the history first. So in her first pregnancy in 2012, she had a, an early delivery and a, um, a moderately large fetal maternal hemorrhage. So um, after someone who's D negative delivers, we'll uh, do a test to estimate how, how what volume of fetal red cells have passed into their circulation and give a, a dose of anti-D targeted to mop up those red cells to help pre prevent them from making an anti-D antibody. And the, 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 the standard minimum dose after delivery is 500 units. Um, this, um, this volume of FMH that she'd had re would require 2,000 units to cover. So it's more than your standard. So she'd need a, an extra large dose. And then we normally advise a, a follow-up sample in 72 hours to make sure all those fetal cells have been cleared. I can't say for, for sure what dose she received or whether she had the follow-up sampling. But when she came in her next pregnancy in 2014, she has unfortunately made an anti-D antibody and also an anti-Big C antibody. So our concern now is that she might be at risk of developing hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. So these antibodies can cross back over the, the placenta now that she's pregnant again. And if her fetus is D positive or Big C positive, those antibodies can bind the fetal red cells and cause them to be destroyed and make the, the baby anemic. Um, or um, after baby arrives, can cause um, high bilirubin and jaundice in the newborn. Now, not all women who uh, have alloantibodies in pregnancy will develop uh, clinically significant hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, so there are a few ways that we can risk stratify a pregnancy. First of all, we can look at the, the levels of the antibodies. In general, the, the higher the level, the greater the chance of um, the, the fetus or the baby being significantly affected. We can test the, the mum's partner to see what um, antigens the baby might inherit. So are they going to be at risk from these antibodies? And now we also have free fetal DNA testing for um, a few of these red cell antigens. So um, the, the RH group and, uh, anti and big K. We can take mum's blood and look for little fragments of fetal DNA that have crossed into her blood and then see if we can type the, the fetus for those antigens. So um, in this pregnancy, first of all, we've looked at the antibody levels. So with anti-D, we have a, a method where we can quantify that, that um, antibody and give you an actual measured level. Um, all the other antibodies, apart from little c, we, we do a titration. And I've given you there some of the, the kind of cutoffs that we know correlate with a relatively low risk of HDFN, moderate and a high risk. And these categories, particularly um, those higher risk categories, make us worry about the fetus being affected um, as opposed to just the newborn. So um, at the first sample we have in this pregnancy, uh, the, the anti-D is already in a kind of moderate risk category, but thankfully the, the anti-C is, is weak. So we test dad. So dad is D positive, um, but we've done his full RH type there. And based on his phenotype, his probable genotype is R1 little r. Now, don't worry if these are unfamiliar terms with you. for you. Um, you. You inherit a D and a C and an E um, as a kind of triplet. Um, and so um, we know dad's probable genotype is a big D, a big C and little e together, and then no D, a little C and a little e together. And he's going to pass one of those to the baby. So you can see if he passes on the, the combination on the left, 
um, the baby's potentially at risk from both of those antibodies. Whereas there's a 50% chance he passes on the combination on the right, in which case we can sit back and relax because baby's not going to express either of those antigens that the mum has the antibodies against. So we go on and test the, the free fetal DNA. Oh, um, luck is on our side. Um, the fetus is D negative. So we can kind of downgrade this to a relatively lower risk pregnancy. So in all um, all pregnant women, we should be repeating the, the blood count, the, the um, group and screen, the antibody screen at 28 weeks. So that was done and she's now made a new antibody. So she's clearly a, what we call a responder, someone who's um, primed to make red cell antibodies. So she makes a, a Duffy B. Um, this is very weak. Uh, and if you recall from the last um, the table I showed before, uh, the magic number for all the other antibodies is 32. So we worry if the titration is more than 32, that there might be a high risk for the fetus. So baby arrives um, without any complication. So we fast forward now to the next pregnancy. If there we go. So again, um, she at booking, she has already a moderately high anti-D quantification, but those other, the anti-Big C is still there and the Duffy B, but they're both weak. And um, the toss of the coin falls in our favour again. So the fetus is RHD negative and Big C negative. So again, we're fairly relaxed and we repeat the blood sample at 28 weeks. But now the that anti-Duffy B is causing us concern. So it's up at a tighter of 32, which um, prompts us to be a bit more worried about this could be um, a risk for the fetus. So where we pick up uh, these higher risk antibodies in pregnancy, we recommend some form of um, additional monitoring. So a referral to a fetal medicine unit and then some additional monitoring to make sure that baby is, isn't developing anemia in utero. And that's done non-invasively via ultrasound scans and then particularly a uh, ultrasound Doppler monitoring. So this looks at the blood flow through the middle cerebral artery of the fetus. Uh, and if the, um, the haemoglobin of the, the fetus drops, you get an increase in the rate of that blood flow because the, the, the poor fetus's body is trying to respond by um, trying to get enough red cells through the brain to maintain um, blood flow. So high Doppler measurements might suggest the baby's becoming anemic. And then in all these pregnancies where there, there might be a risk of HDFN, at delivery, we should be taking a sample from the, the, the umbilical cord of the delivered placenta to, to look at the, the haemoglobin and the bilirubin of that baby and also do a DAT. So that's looking for antibody bound to the surface of the baby's red cells. So this time round, baby arrives again a bit early, 34 weeks. And the, the DAT is two plus for IgG. So there's, there's antibody bound to that baby's red cells. And what we did then is to knock the antibody off and try and identify it and confirm that it is anti-Duffy B. So that's mum's antibody that is bound to baby's red cells. But thankfully, baby wasn't affected clinically. And just as an aside, um, the sample that was taken from mum at the time of delivery, now she's made another new antibody. So she's made an anti little s. So that brings us right up to date. Here we are in the, 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 the main case um, of this year. So again, she books with a, a pretty high quant of anti-D um, and the anti-big C's in a kind of worrying tighter level as well. Um, thankfully, so the, the anti-Duffy B this time is very weak um, and we can't pick up the that anti-little S again this time. But sadly, um, her um her luck has run out in terms of the the fetal typing um that cell-free fetal dna predicts that this baby is rhd positive on this occasion and what we recommend is um so we're going to refer this baby for the the fetal medicine unit for those ultrasounds but we also monitor the antibody through the pregnancy it's generally every four weeks up to 28 weeks and then every two weeks to delivery and you can see on this graph um our second sample by 20 weeks, the antibodies or the anti-D quantifications already leapt up to nearly 30. So she's gone into that high risk group. And then there's another giant leap um, four weeks, around four weeks later, up to nearly 200. 
So she's coming for her um, Doppler ultrasounds and that 25 week um, where we had that 25 week sample and that really high NTD quant, there's some worrying signs for the baby. So there's signs of ascites, which might suggest that the baby's developing heart failure because it's anemic. So those middle cerebral artery blood flow is increased. So this would be an indication for an intrauterine transfusion. So that involves putting a needle through the mum's abdominal wall, through the placenta and into the um, umbilical um, um, vessels and um, injecting blood directly into that baby's circulation. Sorry, we're a bit slow. There we go. Now, we don't give, um, by choice, standard adult blood for an intrauterine transfusion. And as Aga's going to tell us, um, there's a certain specification that we use to make an intrauterine transfusion unit. So I'm just going to concentrate here on the, the serological requirements. Now, baby can't make its own antibodies. What we're worried about is the antibodies from mum that could have crossed over the placenta and now be in baby's circulation. So the antigen requirements for red cells for an IUT are the same as if you were transfusing mum. So um, we'll always give group O, but here we need to avoid the, the D antigen, big C, Duffy A, and she's got this historical um, anti-little s. So ideally we want an anti, anti, uh, a unit that's an antigen negative for all of those. And we give big K negative as, as routine. And then there's various other specifications that we need to meet. So this isn't an off the shelf component. Um, this is something that's going to take a bit of effort to source. But we've got a baby that we're really worried about. Uh, it's potentially very anemic. So um, on this occasion, we gave the best we could. So anyone who works in neonates be aware there's um, um, a product called an, an LVT unit, so large volume top up unit, which has additional specification and, and testing over an adult unit but isn't quite the same of, as a, um, doesn't quite meet the full spec of a, an IUT unit. But what they were able to do is um, adjust the hematocrit, make it a bit more concentrated. Um, and because the mum didn't have a detectable anti little s at this time, we dropped that requirement because it made it possible to source something for this baby, who as it happened, did turn out to be critically anemic. So when they did a fetal blood sample, the haemoglobin was only 40. And um, an IUT using this, um, emergency unit, which was the best we could get, was given. Now, she's only 25 weeks and those antibodies, they're going to keep on crossing the placenta and potentially destroying baby's red cells throughout the rest of the pregnancy. So that she's potentially going to need further intrauterine transfusions and has this complex mix of requirements. So what happened behind the scenes now um, it was a, a mammoth effort um, from various aspects of the, the blood service to um, continually maintain a stock of um, units that would be suitable to make into a, an IUT unit for this lady if she were, if and when she were to need another one, because they also tend to happen fairly unpredictably. So actually to meet the full um, specification in terms of all the antigens and all the other um, special requirements for an IUT unit, only one in 5,000 donors would be suitable. So there's a kind of continually extra testing being done and keeping these units ready, ready to go for her. And one of my colleagues at um, um, the RCI in Collindale described these as unicorn units. But it all paid off. Um, she did need a, a further two intrauterine transfusions, but we had no, these ideal spec units ready. So now she's made it to 32 weeks. And again, the scan's looking really concerning. And at this stage, and her baby can survive at 32 weeks. So better we deliver the baby because then no more antibody can get into it. We've cut this, the, um, the, the link with mum, the um, you know, best for this baby to be out. Just to complicate matters, there's no tertiary neonatal bed available in London. So actually, um, they had to be transferred out of London for delivery. But um, you know, as the, those arrangements were being made, we we're starting to think ahead that this baby might, might need an exchange, neonatal exchange transfusion when it's born. And there's two main reasons you might need to do that. 
So we were anticipating this baby might arrive very anemic. But if you think about it, it's, the baby hasn't bled. Um, it's the, the cells have hemolyzed. So baby's not hypovolemic. So um, if we tried to give enough transfusion to increment the, the red cells, you know, to a, a normal safe hemoglobin level, we're going to give this baby taco. So the only way to get the hemoglobin increment we want is to take some plasma away, which is essentially what an exchange transfusion does. The other advantage is that we're going to be worried about this baby's bilirubin. So in utero, those these destroyed red cells, they release their bilirubin, but it crosses across the placenta and mum's liver deals with it. And we break that connection and baby's own liver is trying um, to deal with this bilirubin. And that's difficult for a, a full term baby's liver, let alone a 32 week gestation baby's liver. So there's risk of this bilirubin um, rising very high, which can potentially then get deposited in baby's brain and cause brain damage. And so uh, another advantage of this exchange transfusion is it helps remove that bilirubin. But the exchange um, unit, again, isn't like an adult unit. It's, it shares a lot of the a lot of similarity with the IUT unit, but it's a bit less concentrated. So again, it's something special that um, we won't have off the shelf for her. But we've got our magic stock of unicorn units. So we had one unit that was suitable for manufacture into an exchange unit. And then again, we did another one the best that we could. So we sent a, a large volume transfusion unit, which meets a lot of the specification. And baby was arrived and did indeed need um, a double volume uh, exchange on the, the evening of, of delivery. But now we've got a baby, we can do some tests on the baby itself. So we confirmed that there was no detectable anti little s in baby's plasma, um, which made it a lot easier going forward from then. So the, the baby's bilirubin remained high on day, day one of life. Um, and um, so they were going to perform another exchange transfusion, another do double volume exchange. And we could get um, units that met the full specification for that because we could drop that little s requirement. And after that, baby did really well. So um, was out of the woods from that um, point of view of the HDFN. And day four, mum and baby were both able to be transferred back to their local hospital where baby could do a little bit of growing before um, being ready to, to go home. But I think this is just a really impressive case that um, brought together the clinical teams, um, kind of the, the clinical advisory teams like myself at the, the blood service, and then um, people who are working across the, the, the supply chain. So the people who were testing all those donations to find additional antigen negative donors, the manufacturing teams who were ready to either make these units into the IUT unit or to get them made back into to general stock hospital services to get the units in the right places, and our ICI labs doing the kind of testing and compatibility work. Um, and great to see it all um, come to such a successful conclusion. Um, and a personal thank you from me to Julia from RCI Collindale, because um, I shamelessly stole some of her figures in this presentation.